righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. love to have any kids if you want to meet me up there on the steps here that would be great how are you guys doing doing good we're gonna do some guessing this morning about what I have in this bag here it doesn't seem like it's doesn't seem like it's very big, but I got three clues for you, and let's see if anyone can get them. First clue, it's got a lot of green. Does that help? No. All right, second clue, it's got a lot of really small teeth. Hmm, no, that doesn't help? All right, one more. Um, you wouldn't want one as a pet. What do you think? Snake? Snake? Turtle, no, no, it's not a snake. All right, I've never done this before, but I have the head of an alligator here. You thought that was an alligator. My, my cousin, this, this was real, my cousin went to Florida like a long time ago and they, he came back with the head of an alligator and he said, this is what I got you when I went to Florida. I was like, wow, I always wanted one. <laughs> All right. I want you guys to look at this alligator for a little bit, and I want you to think about alligators, like what an alligator really looks like. Um, and first question that I have for you is this, like who made the alligator? This is the easy one. God, God yes, right? We all agree, God made the alligator. God made everything. Um, and I want you to think a little bit about alligators and what are some of like, the really special, like unique ways that God made alligators different from other animals? Give me one. Oh, it can rip apart food. Yeah, so that's what all the sharp teeth are for, right? Tell me something else about an alligator. What else do you know? What do you think? It's long. Okay. What do you think? Oh, they can grow up really long and really, yeah. Um, do alligators have short legs? Yeah. yeah. Why? Do, what's good about having short legs? What do you think? Swim fast. Oh, what do you think? to sneak around, like it can get really low to the ground and like can kind of pick food up really quickly, yeah. Really slowly, yeah. Like if this was a whole alligator, we had the body over here and if you touched it, it would be really hard. That's a good thing too. Why is that a good thing for an alligator? Well like if it was hard, if you had really hard skin, that would make you really tough, right? That'd make you strong, and if somebody tried to attack you, you could be like you could defend yourself pretty good, right? Here's here's one other thing I learned about alligators. Alligators can go and they can swim underwater for like 10 to 20 minutes. Can you swim underwater for 10 to 20 minutes? No. no. So like that makes that makes the alligator a really good hunter because it can kind of sneak around. Now I want you to think just a little bit about the alligator. I want you to think about lots of animals too, but as you think about the alligator, we've talked about some different things. The alligator, God made it really special, right? He, he made it to be able to do some things that other animals can't, and he made it really special. You know what though? As we think about an alligator and all the ways that God made like an alligator special, I hope that you guys will remember always that God, he made us, and he made us incredibly unique, incredibly special. Uh, and he, he gave us some, some just incredible ways that he created us. David, in uh, Psalm 139, he talks about what God did and how God is his creator. And this is what he says. He says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You know what? One of my prayers for you guys, for all of us, is that we would recognize that God created us and that God, he doesn't make anything broken. He doesn't make anything junk. And when God made us, he made us wonderfully made. That's a really cool thing to remember. So I hope that you guys, when you go home today, uh, that you'll just keep remembering that. So let's pray and let's ask God to help us to remember. Dear Father, I thank you that you don't make junk, that you made us uh, and that we are your creation, that you made us special, you made us unique in each of our own ways. Uh, and I pray that you'd help us to remember that. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, you guys can go back to your families. Thank you. God, um, meet us with your mercy and your grace in our great need. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would come now by your Holy Spirit uh, and meet us where we're at. If we are happy, if we are celebrating, if we are joyful today, meet us there. If we are hurt and broken and mourning, Lord, meet us there. God, if we are questioning and even disbelieving, Lord, I pray that you would come and you would meet us there. Uh, God, by your mercy, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come now and fill this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. It's, uh, it's, it, it's been a hard week We're in, in a lot of ways. Um, how do you prepare for your last sermon uh, at a church? And uh, I, this whole last uh, month or so, as we've kind of been looking at some passages or sermons I wished I'd pre preached or passages I'd never really got a chance to, uh, to use. And, and this one, okay, I'll admit, I've probably used this passage in sermon, uh, I don't know how many times, but I've never preached directly out of it. And it is... Uh, it is life-changing, it is theology-breaking, one of the most important passages in the entire Bible. Um, and it, it's a passage that can set you free in a million different ways. It is a, a section that, if you misunderstand it, can lead you down all sorts of terrible paths. And it, for me, it's, it's one of those passages I, I go back to all the time to, to remind me who I am uh, and to remind me who I am now in Christ. And uh, it's, it's Romans chapter 7, and we're going to be looking at verses 7 through the end of the book. And uh, Paul Tripp says that the Bible is, is the, the, the greatest self-diagnostic tool that's ever been given to us. It, it, it shows us who we really are. It shows the truth about ourselves, and it doesn't just leave us in the diagnostic stage. It actually provides this amazing remedy this amazing cure and this is Romans 7 if you've got your Bibles turn to Romans 7 we're gonna be starting at verse 7 Paul starts out like this what then shall we say that the law is sin by no means or of course not yet if I had not been if it had not been for the law I would not have known sin for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there, we'll move on. I love how Paul introduces this. Um, the, the, the standard is usually we think that if we could just keep the rules, if we could just do things right, there's going to be a payoff at the end. Uh, it works like that for school. Okay, you guys, seniors graduating, if you study hard, if you go to school, if you're diligent in your studies, what's the payoff? What's the payoff? You get a diploma. You probably learn something along the ways. There's, there's a whole list of good things that come if you can follow them. And we can live life by this. And we, we, I think most of us naturally simply assume if we keep the rules, there's going to be a payoff at the end. And it's true. Paul says it's really clear. He says, I used to think that I had life in, apart from the law. I used to think that there was life because... I'd been good. In Philippians, he says, look, I was, I'm a Jew of Jews. I was born to the right family. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I've got all this list of things that I can hold up to my merit that I've done right. In the end, he says, compared to Christ, I, they're, they're rubbish. They're garbage. They're useless. What he says, the law promises, he says the law is good and it's holy and it's right. The problem isn't with the law. The problem isn't with the law that God has given, that you should be perfect, that you should be holy, that you should be all of these things. The problem isn't with the law. The problem lies in Paul himself. The problem lies in me. The problem lies in you. He'll get on to that a little later on. Uh, pick up again, verse 13. So did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, that being the law. 
in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For, what, for, do I, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, stop right there. There's a part of me that wants to, like, grab Paul and be like, oh, do you really mean that? There's nothing good that dwells in me. Do any of you hear that and kind of get a little offended? Anybody want to hold up their hand and say, wait a minute. There's some good in us. Anybody do anything nice this week? Anybody change a diaper? That was nice. That was good. Uh, anybody uh, help somebody out who needed a hand? That was good. Anybody tell the truth? Hope so. Those are good things, right? We hear this and we're like, wait a minute. And Christians get accused of being self-loathing, like we're obsessed with sin. We're obsessed with perfection. So the point where we all look and say, well, like, well, there's nothing good in me. And if there's nothing good in me, then there's nothing good that I can do. And this is where, uh, if we don't get this, it's, it's foundational to Christian thought. That there are two types of good. There's two types of righteousness. Luther would talk about, there's two kingdoms in this world. There's the kingdom of this world, and there's the kingdom of God. There are things of this earth, and there are things of God. There are, there are temporal things, and there are eternal things. And I, I, I distinguish them like this. There's a capital G good, and there's a lowercase g good. And there's a huge difference between both of them. The lowercase good is the good stuff that we can do. Uh, it's the righteousness of this world. The righteousness of this world is really only concerned with actions. So if somebody... Um, comes and helps me out when I'm in need. Do I care why they're doing it? In the end, do I really care why? Someone stops and helps me change a flat. Do I care if they're just kind of building up their own ego and trying to be a do-gooder and whatever else? Or No, I really just care that they're actually helping me out. Do I care if someone has given money to the church for good reasons. Well, I kind of do, but in the end, as long as the check doesn't bounce. I've said this a couple now, people coming to buy our house. Well, as long as their check doesn't bounce, I don't care what they do with it. Right? That's righteousness of this world. We don't really necessarily care so much about why, we just matter about what is actually happening. And it's, it's basically the criteria we, we, I use at least, for someone I'd like to live next door to or not. Would I like to live next door to this person? It's righteousness of this world. Are, are you basically honest? Because the righteousness of the world, it, it always works in levels. There are some people who are better than others. Amen? Yeah, there are. There are some kids who listen better than others, who argue less about all the rules, less than others, and some more than others. There are relationships that you deal with. There are people you'd like to work for, and there's people you wouldn't like to work for, or people you'd like to work with, or people you wouldn't like to work with. There's people you'd like to be married to, and people you wouldn't want to be married to. And that is the righteousness or the good of this world. And that is in us. We can improve that. We can work on that. I can actually improve on my relationships all over the place by trying to be good. And generally, it's going to help me out a lot. Uh, do you think your boss is going to give a raise to you if you show up on time and work really hard? Yeah, probably. Is that a motivation for you to show up and work hard and do a good job? Yeah, of course it is. You'll actually try to get more education and grow in that. And it's good. You should be about that. But when Paul says, there is no good in me, he's not talking about the lowercase righteousness of this world. He's talking about the capital G good, 
which is holiness, which is perfection, which is the righteousness before God, up against which, as Paul says, I know what I should be doing, but I can't do it. See, the truth of the matter is, I can look at the Ten Commandments, and I can kind of improve in how I'm doing in any one of those things a little bit, but I could never, ever, ever in my life keep them perfectly. I don't think there's any, any uh, uh, coincidence that Paul uses this word covetousness in his description. Say, look, the law showed me what covetousness is. And it produced in me all this coveting. Now, it's easy for me to, I, I can rationalize, uh, thou shalt not steal. Does that make sense to everybody? I mean, it's maybe not if I really want something that you have and I want to take it from you. But when you really think about it, it's like, well, if I took that from you, then somebody else is going to take what I've got from me, or maybe they come in and take that thing from me. So it makes, you shouldn't steal makes sense. Coveting? Think about that. If you want to take, or even just want it from somebody else, you want it for yourself, that's sin. Think about this. You don't even have to go out of your way to take it from them. I don't have to sneak around and rip it off. I don't have to knock you out and take it out of your pocket. All I have to do is desire to have it for myself. I got no chance. I've got no chance. Does that even enter your mind when you see something? Oh boy, I really want that. I wish that was mine. That sin is there. How impossible is is this capital G good, this capital R righteousness. Paul says in that, there's nothing good in me. Even the good things that I do, there are motives and things behind that that creep in that shouldn't be there. One thing you've, I've learned as a pastor over seven years is that there are no pure motives. There aren't. I can't separate things out. I'd love to to say to you that every time I have worked really hard on a sermon, it's because I want the sermon to, to impact and grow and the Word of God to go out well. I do, but there's motives behind that as well. I want you to like me. I want to get a raise. I'm not lying to you. It's true. Behind everything that you do, there are motives that I'd love to say they're not there, that I'm doing this for absolutely pure motives. I haven't had a pure motive in my entire life. It hasn't happened. And when you fail to distinguish between those two things, it screws you up. It will either make you secure in your sin and not caring about it, and so the the capital G good and the lowercase g good, you can say, it doesn't really matter anymore, and so I should sin all the more. Or, if you get the lowercase g good mixed up with a capital G good, you will always be about trying to sin less and be good more, and think that God loves you more when you're doing good, and God loves you less when you're not doing as good as you did the day before. Paul says, when there's nothing good in me, it is meant to show us that he's as desperate for grace as every one of us is. That the desperation for grace leads him to seek a grace, a righteousness, a goodness that doesn't come from inside of himself. That isn't something that he works on to improve, to build, to grow. He looks for it from the outside. Listen to this. This is verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I, I recognize it. I say, it's good. I want to be like that. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And now he meets his conclusion. And his conclusion is, it brings forth this idea of, 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 of recognition of who he is in God's standing. He's not talking about in standing to everybody else around him. Uh, I hope that in seven years that you would 
basically say, Pastor Ed's a good guy. I hope. I hope I haven't broken too many bridges. I hope I haven't knocked them down. I hope I haven't hurt you. I'd like you to be able to say that Pastor Ed's, yeah, he's a good guy. Well, let's make sure that's the lowercase g, good. That I've worked hard, that I've tried to do these things well. And at the same time, I also know that you've listened to a lot of bad sermons. That there are sermons I should repent of. That there have been times that I have gone out on visits because I knew I should, because I knew I had to, more than it was simply because I'm a pastor and I care for you guys and I love you. All those things have happened. I have sinned. I have, I have failed to do some of the things that I totally should have done. I have not made some of the phone calls that I totally should have made. And then when they go on too long, the phone call doesn't mean anything. And there's no way to just take it back. You look at that and you say, oh my goodness. What a wretched man I am. And Paul says those words. What a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? I, I know it's really clear all the good stuff I should be doing. I know it's really clear that I should love God simply because he is God and he is my creator. But I cannot remove self-interest from this equation. The, the, the most profound question I've ever asked by a confirmation student in however many years was when I was a youth pastor in Fergus Falls, and I, a young girl, it was, uh, I think she was in eighth grade, and she, was, she asked me this question after, after confirmation one Sunday, and she was, she was feeling like this, this kind of like guilt. She's like, I know I'm supposed to love God because he's God. But I know also that I love God because I don't want to go to hell. I am self-interested. I don't love God because I, just because he's God. I love God because I'm getting something in return in this relationship. And we hear this and we go, oh, does that sound like sin to you? It actually, though, it reveals the depth of our brokenness. I don't love God just because he's God. I love God because of what he's done for me. I love God because of what he can give to me and bring to me and even what he promises to me. I don't love him with pure motives. And guess what? Grace is bigger and better than I hoped. Grace even covers my motives that are false, my motives that aren't entirely pure. It covers not just my evil wickedness, but my self-righteous goodness, the good things that I should be doing that I do for the wrong motives. Grace is even bigger than that. So Paul says this, Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death that I can't seem to escape? And his conclusion, thanks be to God for Jesus, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Jesus himself said, let your sh light shine before men. So they'd see your good works and, and look to God their Father. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Let your light shine. What's he talking about? Is he talking about the capital G good or the lowercase g good? Is he talking about me just being better? Is he talking about the righteousness of faith? Let that light shine before men. They would see your good works. Sometimes it's not so clear. It's a little bit of both. Uh, should you be a good neighbor? Should you forgive? Should you be generous? Should you forgive even when they don't deserve it? Yeah, you should. Let that shine before those people. And as much as you fail at that, let the righteousness of Christ, the capital G good, the goodness of God, shine even brighter. Because there's nothing more impactful on your neighbor when you come to them and confess, when you live out of your brokenness more than your put-togetherness, it is far more impactful. Look, if you're, if you're always good and your neighbor sees you and you're always dressed right and you always act right and you always do everything right, do you want to hang out with that person? Do you have that 
friend or maybe a relative where that's everything is always perfect? Is it intimidating? Whenever you ask, their kids always have straight A's. They've always got more money than they need. And what makes you even more sick is they're generous with it to other people. <laughs> and here you walk in inside knowing, I almost strangled my son today. I've got three bills that I have no idea how I'm going to pay. My spouse wants to strangle me too. And I'm wearing clothes from Kohl's from four years ago that I found at a garage sale. And your lack of put-togetherness compared to their seeming perfection usually makes you want to basically distance yourself from somebody. But what happens when the facade of righteousness comes down and that person that you thought had it all put together, had it all figured out, admits, I know we've always looked like this, but the truth is, my daughter's ready to move out. And we fight with her like crazy every single night. And as much as my wife and I smile, we've been in counseling for six months. And you have no idea how much credit card debt we've built up. You have no idea. When we live out of our brokenness rather than our put-togetherness, people see grace in us because we rest in what Christ has done. And so Paul, through this, in this passage, so, in so, such great uh, specificity and in great honesty, Paul lives out from his brokenness. What a wretched man am I. I'm supposed to be this super apostle. I'm supposed to be this amazing leader of the church, and you have no idea what goes on inside my head. You have no idea the wrong motives I operate from sometimes. The good things that I should do, I don't do. The wrong things that I should do, shouldn't do, I do. The good things I should be dwelling on and thinking about, mm, not so much. And the bad things that I shouldn't ever even enter into my mind, they're present, they're there, they're real, and I struggle with them. Who's going to save me? But listen to these words of conclusion, and then I'll read through into the beginnings of Romans 8 because they are some of the most precious words in all of Scripture, when I realize that I might be lowercase good, and I can compare myself to other people and think, well, I'm not as good as her, but I'm definitely better than him. And I'm not as, I might not have it all put together, and I'm a little dysfunctional, but I'm not that dysfunctional. Listen to this when Paul's honest with himself, and he recognizes the depth of his sin and his lack of his righteousness and holiness before God. What a wretched man am I who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now, listen to this. That, that kind of war that goes on, listen to these next words and how he puts this to an end. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. It's over. The battle is finished. And I'll leave you with, a, I've quoted this many times, it's from Jack Miller, who says these words, and I, they become so profound to me because I, I, I'll, I'll tell you now, I recognize myself seven years after I started here as a bigger sinner than I was in the day that I started. I understand my brokenness and my depravity more than I did ever before. And I, my only prayer is that I continue to grow in understanding how desperately I need grace. Jack Miller said this, cheer up. You're a lot worse off than you think you are. But God's grace is bigger and better than you ever hoped it would be. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you are a good God who brings good gifts to his people, who speaks words of comfort to people who are in captivity, who brings grace to people who recognize that they don't believe it. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us to join with the Apostle Paul in those words that say, wretched man that, I'm, that I am, because until we actually can say those words, we'll always be suspicious of grace. We'll always wonder if grace is really that good will always add something to grace and add something of our own making 
something of our own goodness and righteousness to the, the equation. So Lord, I pray that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit to see ourselves for who we really are, broken and in need, and that we would see you as the provider who comes and fills that need in your son. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that we would grow in grace, that we would grow in the knowledge of who you are, what you have done, that we would cling desperately to your word from this day forward to the end of our life, that we would never think that we've graduated from the need for grace, but we would only understand more and more just how much we do need it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet us in our need with your great provision in Jesus Christ. Amen. sharing special music this morning. My hope. From 1 Peter 1. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God.
please stand up. <laughs> uh, just before the benediction, I, I said this a couple weeks ago when we had the farewell, but uh, thank you. Thank you for being uh, gracious to us, for loving us, for putting up with me at times. <laughs> um, for all that you've done, you're a blessing, and I pray that you would continue to be a blessing uh, to the next person God has called to this church, that you be, continue to be a blessing and grace to this community. And I'll, I'll leave you with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward me and give you peace. May the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in God's peace. <laughs>